go into a city that's set on a hill. Its ruler and maker is the Lord God above. Oh, I'm going to a city and it's set on a hill. And someday I'll be in heaven and there'll be no sorrow there. Oh, I'm going to a city. It lies four square. The gates are made of jasper and I'll see Jesus. Hello, everybody. God bless you today. This is Susan Puzio, and I want to welcome you to the Prophetic News radio broadcast. And we're heard on Spreaker, iTunes, and many other platforms. We also have our YouTube channel, Prophetic News TV. And we have our website, propheticnews.com. Also, our two very important books that are on Amazon, Paula White, President Trump's Pastor. And this is a very important book. It's a biography of about Paula White. And it's very timely for the time we're living in because Paula is holding these pastor's luncheons around the country to help Donald Trump get elected and... This is not the right person to be a spiritual advisor to anyone, really, because Paul is not saved herself. And I would advise you, really, to look at my YouTube channel and examine the the evidence. In light of what we're going to talk about today, it's very important for us to know who people are and to present credible evidence about who they are before things get out of hand. And this whole situation there with Mike Bickle at IHOP KC and a friend of mine today on Facebook made a very important comment. He talked about the spiritual adultery that was going on in this movement. And that's very important to look at. I myself... I really feel for the people that are involved as far as the people in the church and people that were in the Bible school and people, uh, former staff members. It hurts. And I, I really feel for these people because I, I understand how you can be involved in something and believe in something like myself who was in the Word of Faith movement for 15 years and I finally got out of it in 1997. I had to repent of all of the teachings and some of the things that I said and I did because it, it wasn't God. And this is a time for reflection for everybody involved or everyone that's been involved to look back and to say, yeah, this is where I missed it. This wasn't right. This movement was not really based on God's word. It was based on idolizing a room. And people say, well, what's going to happen to the prayer movement? What's going to happen to the prayer movement? There's always been a prayer movement. Since Jesus instituted his church, there's been a prayer movement. There's people praying around the world 24 hours a day, there's millions of Christians around the world. So IHOP KC didn't have a, a hold or a handle on prayer. Like they were the only ones praying 24 hours a day. And it became an idol. And people looked at that room like that was the, that was the place where you could really meet God. Well, God decided he was going to judge it. And he was going to judge it harshly. And he is doing that. But he he will not have any, any other gods before him. And he'll make sure that we know it. In the long run, God was very merciful to Mike Bickle. He was very merciful to everyone involved there because this could have happened a long time ago. God waits. He gives people space to repent. And then it's all uncovered. 
and it's one thing after another that's coming out and it, and it's one more allegation that's worse than the the one before and there'll be more to come i'm sure there'll be more to come so it is a good time for everyone to examine themselves and to look at what they actually believed when they were a part of IHOP, Casey, and when they followed the teachings of Mike Bickle. And compare it with scripture. That's what I had to do when I came out of Word of Faith in 1997. I took myself out of public ministry, and I decided that I was going to take my Bible, and it was going to be one translation. I wasn't going to look at all the, compare all the translations because they, they can all say something different. And I was going to wash out my brain. <laughs> the, the washing of the water of the word, yeah. And I found out that a lot of the things that I had believed and I had taught didn't line up with God's word. When I stopped looking at reading other people's books and listening to sermons, that's what I did at that time. I'm, I like to read books, and I, I do like to listen to some people's sermons. But at that time, I decided that I just needed the Word of God, and I could find my answers there. And that's what's going to happen in this case. Even one of the former staff members there, a man by the name of Dean Briggs, said that they should close it up. And I agree. God may just do that. Just it, it, He may just close the whole thing down and they can start all over again. But there is, there is, a, there is many developments and one of them is the uh, IHOP KC 24-hour prayer and constant music that they did over there in the, in the prayer room. They've closed it down, and it says on their YouTube channel, IHOP KC is entering a season of mourning and repentance, and you can join us online. There will only be two of these services at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. beginning Monday, February 12th. So that's a good development because for months... Even when these allegations first started to break, they were kind of joking, have coming to services trying to joke, and they weren't taking it seriously, and they uh, they just didn't act right about the whole thing. So then they they also put out a statement which you could read on YouTube and I'll I'll read read it to you. Words cannot express the anger, shock, heartbreak and sadness we have experienced as we have learned of allegations and testimonies of sexual abuse and manipulation concerning Mike Bickle, founder of IHOP KC. We believe that Mike Bickle sexually abused and manipulated Jane Doe and Tammy Woods, who's a new woman that's come forward, who was a minor at the time. His predatory and abusive actions are sick and violate the word of God. The marriage covenant and holiness, we condemn them in their entirety. In hindsight, we realize let me get this up for you in hindsight we realize that mike's two friday night messages on october 13th and 20th were manipulative attempts to construct a narrative of innocence concerning himself we deeply regret allowing him on the platform, and we acknowledge and apologize for the pain and confusion this has caused. 
Additionally, our staff meeting on October 27th lacked the necessary disclosure and candor to meet the gravity of the situation. For this, we also apologize. Many in our community have been pained by our communications regarding these allegations. We are sorry we fell short in this area and left you feeling unseen, unheard, and unappreciated, the IHOP KC leadership team. Yeah, and it's a good thing they finally did it. They should have done it a long time ago. But instead of acting biblical, they went and hired a crisis manager. They got attorneys involved. And it looked like it was a cover-up. That's what it looked like anyway. It looked like a cover-up. And of course, there's tens of millions of dollars involved here. So, of course, people are going to try to save their, their money and their salaries. And if you, if you want to uh, look at some of the financial statements, if you go to my YouTube channel, and I have a video there called Mike Bickle IHOP Takes in Almost $70 Million in Three Years. And you can see some of the financial information from 2015, which they took the total revenue was $24 million. In 2016, the total revenue was $23 million. In 2017, it was $21 million. And you can go to the ECFA website. The, it's ECF for Frank A., ECFA website, it's the Evangelical Accountability, Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. You can go there and you can pull up the document. You can also go to 990 Finder, nonprofits, and you can look at some of the financial documents there for Forerunner Ministries, uh, Friends of the bridegroom and so what's going to happen with all this money that they have should they have a fund where they pay off the victims should they divide the money to to uh, church members who's who's going to keep this money if the place does disband and the place does close up, which I believe it should. I think there was a prophecy years ago. I think David Wilkerson had the prophecy about what was going to happen to PTL back in the 1980s that he saw bats flying through the place or it was something like that. I'm going to try to find that prophecy and let you know more about it for next time. But when I went there after the fall, a few years after the fall, it, it looked haunted. It looked, it, it looked haunted. And that could be what happens here because it did this place here. It did not have a good foundation. It was founded uh, by a man who... Uh, lied and deceived people. And like like the leadership said in their statement, yeah, it was sick. It was sick. So it did not have a good foundation to begin with. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with this. God is judging the place right now, so anything could happen. And 
it'll be for the best. It'll be for everybody's good, even though it's very painful right now for people that are still attending there. And for people that attended there in the past, yeah, it's all it's all very painful. But let's hear what Hebrews 12 has to say. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned, or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I love that. Our God is a consuming fire. And he will burn up everything that needs to be burned up. Jesus Christ gave his life for the church he he takes the church very, very seriously. He does not approve of people abusing his sheep the way 
Many people have been abused over the years by leaders who really do not have a heart for God. They're hirelings. They, they do the work of the ministry for, for just for money, and they, their heart is not after God. And they use all kinds of manipulative techniques, and they take advantage of people, and God's not pleased with all of this. So he's going to put an end to it. And hopefully everyone that was involved with impure motives will be rebuked and chastened. And hopefully they'll come out of it and get saved in a real way and turn back to the Bible Read, their, read God's word and stay in God's word and, and only teach God's word and don't teach all this, extra, all this extra stuff that's not necessary, which draws our attention to human beings instead of to God. I believe Jesus is a miracle worker. I believe he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I don't doubt that. But all the extra things, all the trips to heaven and, and uh, the chariot rides and, and uh, all these other things that people do to draw attention to themselves, it's not of God. But the biggest, the biggest development last week in this story, and why I am reporting on it again, was a lady named Tammy Woods came forward and she was abused by Mike Bickle when she was 14 years old. And also she filed a police report. So it's a big development, and I'm going to play a couple audios from the article that was written. She took the story to the Kansas City Star, I believe the newspaper there. And also she filed this police report. I don't know what will become of that. I don't know what the statute of limitations is, but anyway, I'm not. I I won't play the whole article for you because there may be a copyright on it. But I'm going to play a couple of these audios for you, and you you can hear them for yourself. This is the Tammy Wood story. First claims that involve sexual abuse of a minor. She alleges the abuse began when she was a babysitter for Bickle's two young children. Tammy Woods, who told her story exclusively to the Star this week, said the abuse occurred in the early 1980s in St. Louis, where Bickle pastored a church before moving to Kansas City and later founding the 24-7 Global Prayer Ministry Ahop in 1999. She said the abuse took place in Bickle's car, at her home, in the church and in his office, and that it involved sexual contact but not intercourse. Woods, now 57 and a mother and grandmother, said she didn't tell anyone for 43 years. But after watching the details unfold about a woman identified as Jane Doe, whose sexual abuse allegations were made public in October and led to Bickle's removal and upheaval in the round-the-clock prayer movement, Wood said she couldn't keep silent any longer. She told her husband, some family members, and her pastors last week. And on Saturday, she called St. Louis police and filed a report. This is my story. It really happened. I'm not Jane Doe, I'm Tammy, and you did this, said Woods, who is using her maiden name, referring to Bickle. But I don't want you to continue controlling the narrative of my life today as Mimi as mom. She said she hopes that by speaking out, somehow it helps the others to find their voice and say, you know what? We don't want to have a life sentence of shadows and lies. We don't want to be given a script, like we can be manipulated as some pawns. Bickle, when contacted by email several times on Wednesday, did not provide a comment. The international prayer movement has been in turmoil since allegations against him first surfaced in late October. So it's, it's very shocking. Very, very shocking. Here's part two. It started with babysitting. 
Wood said she first met Fickle in the summer of 1980 when her family started attending South County Christian Fellowship, his church in St. Louis. The family went to a potluck dinner at a church member's condo, and Fickle and his wife, Diane, were there. Fickle asked her how old she was, she said, and couldn't believe she was just 14. Fickle then asked her if she did any babysitting. When she said yes, he told her it would be great if she could babysit the couple's two sons, one who was younger than two and the other a newborn. Soon after that, Wood said, Bickle called her at her uncle's veterinary clinic, where she had a summer job answering phones and scheduling appointments, and invited her out for pizza to talk about the babysitting job. He picked her up and they went to Mazio's, she said. At that time, I was the most shy 14-year-old you could imagine, she said. Straight-A student, perfectionist. I had never been on a date before. I was so intimidated. I just remember feeling so overwhelmed. Bickle asked her what she knew about Jesus. She said, which was basically nothing. He said he and his wife went on dates every Monday night and would love for her to babysit. She started babysitting on Monday nights and other times when she was needed. Bickle would pick her up and take her home, she said. During those times, he started taking a special interest in her and sort of mentoring me in spiritual things like the Bible and Bible study. He gave her books to read about missionaries and revivalists, she said, and her heart was actually really coming alive in those things and wanting a relationship with the Lord. He gave me my first Bible, like my first study Bible, she said. He had my name engraved on it, Tammy Woods. He wrote in it, my beloved Tamara, and some nice things. And I guess his wife Diane had read that and said, you can't say those things. Do it again, do over. And he took that out and wrote something more generic. Her dad worked on Saturdays, Woods said, and her sister was involved in acrobatics. Sometimes, if their mom was busy, Bickle would drive her sister to acrobatics, then take Woods to a park where they would hang out and talk, and he'd talk about the Lord. Bickle also would drive her home from church youth group on Saturday nights. Her parents never caught on that something was amiss, she said. Around the time she entered her freshman year of high school that fall, Wood said, Bickle was driving her home one night when he pulled his yellow Volkswagen rabbit off the road and into an undeveloped lot. And he just said, I just want to talk to you for a minute. I have a question for you. Do you feel for me as more than a friend? And I remember my heart racing because I'm thinking as a 14-year-old, I'm busted. I've been crushing on this 25-year-old, and he knows, and I'm going to get in trouble. I just nodded, waiting for the correction from a mentor, like, this is inappropriate. But he didn't say that. He said, now I have another question. Do you think that I feel the same? It caught her off guard, she said, and she didn't know how to respond. All I could say was, I don't know. And he said, well, I do. Mm. It's awful. It's awful. And if he had just come out in the beginning and confessed and been honest with the body of Christ, maybe all of this wouldn't have happened. But don't play around with God because the more you try to cover it up when it's judgment time, the more you're going to hang yourself. And that's what's happening. When school started, she said, Bickle wanted her to call him once a week on her lunch hour. There were two pay phones at the main entrance, and she would get up from the cafeteria, go to put a quarter in the pay phone, and call his direct line. She said he would talk about what he'd been doing and reading and also tell her he was thinking of her, missed her, and looked forward to seeing her. People were starting to notice. She said, I had to answer to this social circle of, who are you calling? Who are you talking to? I never told them who. It was a lot of pressure. As things progressed, she said, when she was still 14, he would hold her, embrace her, and play with her hair. 
he told her that he loved her. And a few times, she said, Bickle mentioned something that has surfaced as a common thread among other women who have recently accused him of sexual abuse and inappropriate behavior. He believed that Diane, his wife, would die, that we could be together, Wood said, adding that she never heard him say that God had told him that, as some other women said he had done. He also told me that Diane believes this too. And on one of those occasions, Wood said, he did say to me, and you could be Lukey's mom. She said Bickle first kissed her at her home on a Saturday morning when no one else was around. She was still just 14. He would kiss my neck, he would kiss my cheeks, he would kiss my forehead, she said. But the first, like, kiss, kiss was in my house. He kind of pulled me into my bathroom, and he kissed me like a man kisses a woman. After that, she said, things progressed to fondling and beyond. He never had sexual intercourse with me. It's very disturbing. Very, very disturbing. But the article, I'll post a link for it on my YouTube page because I'll, I'll post this program up there also. And if you want to read the article, you can do that. And it's quite lengthy. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so as by fire, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself, if any man among you seemeth to be wise in his own world, in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening. Here, here's, here's an arrogant statement, if there ever was one. The United States in the last 25 years has come out of the prayer room at IHOPKC. He actually estimated that half of the prayer that's been lifted up in the United States in the last 25 years has come out of the prayer room. Yeah, that's Eric Bolst, the crisis manager, saying that half of the prayer for the last 25 years in the United States came out of IHOP Casey. Please stop already. There, there's tens of millions of Christians in this country that pray. Tens of millions of Christians praying all over the world. That's arrogant. That's an arrogant statement. Here's a statement that was made by Michael Sullivan, who was a former leader there at I have. Let's listen to what he has to say. I feel a deep stirring today to say some things, especially to the younger generations of Dear Christ followers, as a man who has been in active ministry in the charismatic wing of the church world for 50 years. I was a senior leader with Mike Bickle from 1987 to 1999 during a bulk of his KCF slash Metro tenure before he founded IHOP KC, which is another story all its own. I have publicly done this before and I need to do so again now. I want to stand before you to apologize for the known and unknown ways I, and any of my past fellow leaders, enabled the promotion of both the power and discipline aspects of our faith to undermine and negate the centrality of walking in rich agape love. CF 1 Corinthians 13,1-3, 2 Timothy 1,7, too much Corinthianism, true gifts mixed with prideful carnality, had and has been going on in our corridors of male-dominated church-slash-ministry leadership for too long. I am saddened and chagrined to have been associated with and complicit in promoting such cultures. 
I apologize to you for wrongly defending some of these compromised leaders and ministry settings in the past and not speaking up boldly enough about these big matters. Mike has now, under pressure, publicly confessed to being unfaithful to his wife. Our hearts are broken for Diane in this horrific exposure. We know he has used his ministerial image and position to spiritually, emotionally, and sexually abuse people. We know he recently lied to cover up his, now admitted, moral failures. We know he deceitfully used prophecy to curry sympathy by fabricating a super-spiritual global narrative. We know he imagined for decades that he was clean before God and others without the need to be accountable to anyone for his immorality and clergy misconduct. Questions remain regarding how many other people he possibly victimized, how recently such behaviors might have occurred, and how offers of status and financial favors potentially played into his manipulations. We also have been left to wonder if other leaders he groomed perpetrated abuses in the kind of eccentric culture he curated. There is also much devastation that IHOPKC's defensive and legalistic institutional response is doing to the faith of so many followers near and far. Many amazing and sincere believers have been attracted to Mike's past leadership and the message of IHOPKC, I will write more around the corner about some of the more hidden and subtle errors embedded in this alluring movement. This is not to even mention how this debacle is destroying the witness of the church and profanes the name of Jesus to a watching, disgusted world. I urge the IHOPKC leadership to work with the advocate group to forge a mutually acceptable process to initiate a deeper investigation into the nature and scope of IHOPKC's past abuses. I can vouch for the AG's godly and conscientious motives from the beginnings of their sacrificial and compassionate efforts. A more thorough professional and independent inquiry is certainly in order. We all need to ask what appropriate contrition, confession, and restitution looks like for God's justice to be served and for His mercy to hopefully be unleashed upon the IHOPKC community. With many tears. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be, there's many tears. There's many, many tears. And there'll be many more. But in the end, it'll be for for God's glory, and it'll be to strengthen the church for the days ahead. We have to be strong in the days ahead. We, in the days ahead, we have to ha have a strong foundation that's based on God's word and not on fads, not on movements, and not on other people. But on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. These are sobering times. It's sobering times for what's going on around the world. Sobering times for the church, very sobering times for the people there in Kansas City who are suffering. And they are, they're devastated by all of this. It hurts. But we have to remember that no matter who, what leader falls or what another person does, it can't ever affect our relationship with Jesus Christ. He's faithful and true. He's a merciful God. And he may, makes a way of escape. And he'll make a way of escape for everyone involved as far as the leadership there in Kansas City, the people who've attended there currently, who have, are attending there currently and who have attended in the past. So we'll see what happens. And we'll see if Mike Bickle will totally repent and come forward Yeah, instead of hiding, hiding. You can't hide from God. People try to do it all the time. They try to hide things like God doesn't see it. He sees it. He sees it. And it's only for our own good when he, he uncovers those hidden works of darkness 
He said he would. So it's a time of reflection for all of us to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith, and to take seriously the days that we're living in. And it's very encouraging to see how some members of the body of Christ have uh, reported on the story and have come together as far as, no, we don't want this anymore in our leadership. We don't want this kind of thing. And there, there's a big resounding, no, we're not going to take it anymore, and we're not going to put up with it. So that is very, very encouraging that uh, there's been a real unifying presence for believers here that we can see what's going on, we know what's going on, and we don't want these kind of things going on in the church. We don't want, especially leaders, to abuse God's people without, especially without really publicly repenting and coming forward with a, with godly sorrow, but instead of arrogance and pride and trying to hold on to the kingdom that you built, that was built on sinking sand anyway. So we'll continue to pray for the people involved and our hearts go out to them as far as the victims and Mike's wife, the uh, everyone that's been hurt by this scandal. And yet we understand that it, that judgment begins in the house of God and it's going to be a good thing for us. It's going gonna, it's gonna to separate the sheep from the goats and the wheat from the tares. There'll be a separation. There'll be those that won't accept it. They won't accept the chastening and they won't accept the judgment. But then there'll be so many more that will and that will understand exactly why it happened, why it had to happen. And we'll be stronger for it. Amen? So God bless you today. Remember the most important thing is maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you can ask him to come into your life today. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and confession is made with salvation unto the Lord. So if you don't know Jesus and you don't have peace, and you don't have joy, you can ask him to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins, repent of your sins, and he will give you a brand new life. He'll give you peace and joy unspeakable. And no matter what any other human being does, Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's a promise. God bless you all today. Thanks for listening. be